Continuing on from where we left off last time with realism, I had this slide on the previous lecture as well, but I just wanted to remind you of some of the context of this time. Remember that starting around this point in time, we're seeing a lot of avant-garde artists. They are really fed up with these stuffy and crowded salon spaces. They um, are also disappointed with a lot of the requirements that the salon has. They're very stiff and stringent about their requirements for artworks and a lot of artists are like I don't want to paint like that. So a lot of them then move to gallery spaces instead where the paintings have a little bit more room to breathe and the artists have a little bit more freedom in terms of what they can paint and in which styles that they are painting. So we started seeing this artistic rebelliousness, this avant-garde movement of artists with the realism movement where we saw artists that were painting non-conventional subjects and then they were starting to also broach on more non-conventional painting methods. So painting in a more loose manner and making things kind of like gritty and ugly and basically the way that they actually are. We're going to continue to see those kinds of things pushed even further as we delve into Impressionism and post-Impressionism. So we're going to start with Impressionism because it's first. So you're probably all familiar with the concept of Impressionism to at least some extent. You probably did a project when you were in elementary school that involved oil pastels where you were creating these very short, thin lines to make this colorful scene. I think a lot of students recreate Starry Night, that Van Gogh painting, which we will cover in post-Impressionism. Um, this movement is essentially about color and light. In a lot of cases, you are not going to be seeing a lot of hard outlines around figures um, and elements of paintings. One of the exceptions to that is going to be works that are in the Japanese -mo style, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. So Impressionism is one of these first avant-garde movements that is emerging out of the mid-19th century and really was a catalyst in this movement of or the collection of movements that were deviating from classical norms, which involved lots of soft blending and these very soft transitions between colors and shades. So sfumato, um, we're not really seeing as many idealized or hypersexualized figures, um, and we're not seeing super extreme detail. What's super cool about impressionist paintings is that from far away they make a lot of sense, and the image kind of like is very cohesive and it comes together into something that's recognizable to the human eye. But when you walk up to an impressionist painting, the details start to become a little bit more obscured. Um, we'll also be seeing this um, with some regularity with post-impressionism as well. But impressionism, think of it like a color printer where you have this layering of colors on top of one another and when you zoom in very close it doesn't really make sense but when you step back and you get a, a sense of the whole big picture then it all comes together and it makes sense. So what you'll also notice about Impressionism is that there's a focus on time. There are specific moments within the day that are being captured, particularly by plein art artists like Claude Monet. He'll oftentimes paint the same subject multiple times and at different times of the day. This um, was a fairly common practice for these artists who were working outside of the studio. You can imagine that the light is only going to be looking like this for like maybe 45 minutes in a given day. So it, it really stands to reason that you would bring lots of canvases with you and you would work on the canvas that corresponds to the point in time of the day where the light is matching this exact view. All right. So oftentimes, like with the haystacks, for example, there are several haystack paintings by Claude Monet and they're scattered all over the world. I believe there's actually one in the Getty nearby in L.A. So it's about capturing an experience, this ephemeral uh, particular moment in time, rather than a scientific, objectively, quote unquote, accurate image or something that's intended to represent a composite of a place. There is an element of capturing like this reality of the scene, but at the same time, there's almost a like a surreality to it where there's this very ephemeral and temporary aspect. So there's almost kind of like a little bit of vanitas being injected into these paintings. 
What you'll also notice too is that these paintings are very spontaneous and free. You can see the individual brush strokes that are being used to compose this image. Um, especially when you get up close to these paintings, you can see the individual strokes and sometimes you can even see the bristles of the brush in there. Um, also plein air painting is becoming a lot more common because painting is becoming easier. So one of the ways that painting is made easier and a little bit less cumbersome is that paint is finally coming in tubes. So before this point in time, artists would usually actually have to make the paint themselves. They would buy pigments and a binding agent, and then they would actually grind the pigment and mix it in with a binding agent in their studio, or they would have an assistant do it. So now that paint is coming in tubes, it's a lot more portable. You're not dealing with all of this powdery substance. It's also in this closed system, so it's not drying out so easily. So artists are spending more and more time outside painting subjects from life rather than doing short studies in like watercolor and pencil outside and then compiling them into these major composite images in the studio. Another thing that is happening towards the um, mid to later part of the 19th century is that Japan is opening up to the rest of the world for the first time in several hundred years. So this is 1868, the Meiji Restoration. You probably talked about it in uh, world history. This is when a lot of artwork and like cultural elements of Japan are becoming visible to the Western world in particular. And one of the most common items that was coming out of Japan and disseminating into the West were woodblock prints. So woodblock prints, we're going to be covering them when we cover Japan in a couple of months, were these mass-produced images that were very affordable. It was said that you could actually buy a woodblock print in the streets of Edo, Japan for the same price as a bowl of ramen. So it's this very affordable, accessible form of art. And a lot of people in the West um, saw this and they were very much inspired by the accessibility of the art as well as the kind of ephemerality where you're having these simple subjects, something that is appealing to the masses and in a lot of cases very provincial and oftentimes Arcadian in nature. You have these very simple scenes. You're not really having a focus on like members of the ruling class or um, the church. It's rather like scenes from daily life or even nature. A lot of um, artists in the West are seeing these woodblock prints and they're inspired by the medium of woodblock printing itself as well as the subjects. So lots of artists like Mary Cassatt start creating printed works. They're not necessarily wood blocks. In her case, she did a lot of etching and aquatints. Um, and then some artists also created their own versions of wood block prints. I think Van Gogh did several um, paintings where he attempted to recreate the, the scenes that were depicted in these ukiyo-e Japanese prints. So there's only one artwork in the AP curriculum that I believe really represents Impressionism as most art historians would define it. I've included a couple of other works here to give you a sense of what Impressionism typically is and typically what it looks like. These pieces are pretty unified in their color palettes. There's lots of blues and greens. That is not necessarily like a unifying element of Impressionism. However, nature does feature pretty prominently in Impressionist paintings. There's also lots of scenes of daily life, lots of women and children, people that are chilling out in fancy clothes in the countryside, um, lots of nice blue skies. And what you'll notice too when you're looking at the paintings is that there's a similarity in the rendering. There's these very loose brush strokes. You can oftentimes see the, the kind of brush that is being used by the artist. A lot of elements of the piece are simplified. You're not seeing every single eyelash or every single hair in the eyebrow here. You're not seeing every strand of hair. What the artist is doing rather is they're kind of blending elements elements together and they're exploring the space and they're exploring the subject with a couple of very well-placed and intentional brush strokes. They are also very intentional about how they're using color. You'll notice that a lot of these figures are very cohesive in their color palettes. We're not just seeing green in the lily pads. We're seeing green come up in the reflections in the water over here. We're also seeing it in these pond reeds. And same thing with the blue. We're not just seeing it in the water, but we're also seeing it pop up a little bit in the lily pads and in the negative space between them. So these paintings are very visually cohesive. You're not just seeing color in one place. The artist is being strategic 
strategic about where they are placing color. One of the reasons I love this piece right here by Morisot is that she's using this, this beautiful lavender purple and she's sprinkling it throughout the piece in these very strategic areas, guiding our eye around the piece and even in these areas that you wouldn't expect it, like around the, uh, in the negative space of the hand right here. So this is to give you a sense of what Impressionism is. There's lots of very evocative brushstrokes, um, lots of like dappled light, and you'll notice too in a lot of cases that there aren't really that many outlines. Everything is kind of fuzzy looking. Um, when we get to post-Impressionism, you'll see that this fuzziness kind of disappears, and I'll show you some examples of post-Impressionism in just a moment. So this is our like quintessential impressionist painting in the AP curriculum, and I think rightfully so it is by Claude Monet. So this is one of several paintings that Monet did of this particular station, and each of the paintings in this series was set at a different time of day or year. So there were only two paintings in the series that had like a really bright and clear day. A lot of the other paintings in the series tend to be a lot darker and depict these cloudy or rainy days. To give you an example, here are two paintings that show kind of these more overcast days. You'll notice that the palettes are a lot darker and like more brown. You can see this kind of muddiness to these pieces. In contrast, when we look at this painting, it's very bright. You can see this beautiful lemon yellow that is being used to pick out the sunlight against the facades of these buildings and then also coming through the, the skylights in the ceiling right here and onto the ground. We're also seeing the way that the light is interacting with all of this um, smoke. So the, this is a train station, and of course these are powered by steam engines. So we're seeing lots of that um, condensation being represented here. And what's super interesting as well is that he's using it as this mode to convey a sense of atmospheric perspective, showing that there are certain things that are in front of other things. For example, this is another boxcar right here in the background, and this is a boxcar in the foreground, and you'll notice that the smoke is obscuring this to the point where it's become a lot more dull and almost like a um, blended more into the background, whereas this boxcar right here is a lot more opaque, it is more green, and it's standing out is very clearly closer to us, the viewer, than this boxcar is. So um, there's a lot of organic and inorganic elements too that are being explored in this piece. We of course have these very free-flowing organic lines and shapes that are being conveyed in the smoke right here, but there's also a lot of more geometric shapes that are being conveyed in the architecture of the station right here as well as the building. What he's not doing though, he's is he's not going within with a ruler or a straight edge and making these lines and he's not making them uniform thick um, throughout. He's being very strategic about how he is conveying these lines. They are not dominating the space. They're not really making the sky seem any smaller or less grand. It is just kind of an indication of something that is there. Same thing for when this area interacts with the, the, the ceiling. He's made it light to create this interesting relationship between the positive and the negative space here, and also conveying that this grid-like structure is in front of this part of the rafter in the back. So a lot of art critics really disliked this sort, these sort of paintings that Monet created. A lot of them were very critical of the smoke. They're like, I can barely see the paintings. They're so covered in smoke. And then um, there were also a lot of um, critics that did not like the fact that he played such a he, he conveyed this this sense of like this very busy industrial atmosphere and a lot of people said it's ugly like you're portraying like a really ugly part of Paris like the smoke and the machines and the train tracks like this is dirty it's the equivalent of like painting the the dingiest um like 
subway system in New York City. That's kind of like what people thought of this as. Typically, when you saw paintings of contemporary Parisian life at this point in time, the industry is playing a smaller role. There's more of a focus on the sky and on these like very grand and lavish buildings. And the industry is kind of relegated to the side. Like there, there's an acknowledgement of it. They're like, oh yeah, look at how technologically advanced we are. We have these railways and commuter lines, but they're made to be very pretty. In this sense, like Monet doesn't really care about making these railways pretty. He is very deliberate about placing this boxcar right here and then having another one like right in the middle in the background and then having the steam engine in the front right here that's kind of interrupting this space. He doesn't really care. He's more about painting things as he sees them at this particular point in time. A lot of critics also said that they didn't like the way that the figures were depicted. And you'll notice when you look at this piece that th there are recognizable human figures, um, especially in the bottom right. However, again, when you zoom into this painting, like the you are not able to um, distinguish the individual features of these humans. You're not seeing eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Rather, you're seeing a sort of like composite stick figure. You can tell that this figure is in the front because he's the largest and that these figures are kind of in a group in the back. He's put in just enough information for us to register, yes, that is a human. Yes, these are some other humans, but they're not dominating the piece. They're not any more or less detailed than anything else in the piece. He's kind of treating everything the same. And a lot of critics were like, mm, humans are the best. So he was really a trailblazer, a vanguard in terms of this method of painting where you're not really giving an emphasis to any one subject over the other. It's a focus on color, light, and shape rather than the subject or subjects, which is always super interesting to see. So to give you a sense of what this place actually looks like to see how the artist was treating this scene, um, here is a Saint, here's the St. Lazar station today. You can see again that these beams across the ceiling are quite heavy and he's made them very light in this image. So he's very deliberately uh, changed some things about this image to simplify things down to their base parts while also conveying this sense of atmosphere and this very cohesive painting. And here again are some other views of St. Lazarus Station. Our next work is in the style of Japonisma, which is again this um, mode of rendering that was very much influenced by Japanese woodblock prints. This particular work was by Mary Cassatt. She was a very famous female impressionist at her time. She was actually born um, on the east coast of the United States and she ended up um, going between the east coast and Paris um, while she was working. And she managed to do a lot in her life despite the challenges of being a woman artist at this time. So she created this artwork right here. She's known best for her paintings, particularly of women and children, usually with the diminished presence or even absence of men. A lot of the scenes that she paints are very domestic in nature, they're very soft, and perhaps most Notably, in a lot of cases, they are virtually devoid of this eroticization of women or this like commodification of women. You have probably recalled lots of the images of women that we've seen recently in the curriculum. You might have Olympia come to mind or the Grand Odalisque or Venus of Urbino. Oftentimes, those women are very commodified. They are very obviously painted in a way that is intended to cater towards the male gaze. They're supposed to look sexy, they're supposed to look submissive or pretty, or it's about their bodies in a very overt way. Whenever you see pieces by Cassatt, especially pieces that of hers that are nudes, you'll notice that there's a very objective treatment of the female form. There's not a lot of detail, for example, in the breasts. They are very much just kind of like there and they're not really treated any differently from the rest of the piece. Same thing with the face. This is not a piece where this figure is necessarily aware of our presence, but at the same time, it doesn't really feel voyeuristic. It doesn't feel like we're peeking in on something that we shouldn't be seeing, which is something that you get in a lot of these um, like more romantic paintings or these kind of like sexy frilly paintings. 
In this sense, we're just kind of like seeing a woman, she's doing her hair, she's doing a very average, everyday, normal thing, and we're not really given the sense that we're supposed to be feel guilty about seeing her in this way. So we're going to talk about the title a little bit. So coiffure is a term that usually refers to the preparation of one's hair. Typically, especially in the West, but it, of course in other cultures as well, the preparation of one's hair um, is oftentimes defined by their social class. If you are a particularly rich person or you are of high means or of good means, then you can hire somebody to help you with your hair and to style it in these very elaborate ways. Just like how clothes are used used to distinguish people's classes. Um, for example, if you have clothes that are more elaborate of ma are, are made of nicer materials, then you're considered more wealthy. Same thing with hairstyles. If your hair is more elaborate or involves more work, then typically that is another wealth or status symbol. So coiffure is typically this more genre term that is associated with high class women preparing their hair or having their hair prepared. In this sense though, the woman is preparing her hair alone and it's in a very simple bun. It is this subject that is typically um, generalized in these uh, very lavish scenes. You, you, you might, have things of like Marie Antoinette or Velasquez's um, Las Meninas coming to mind where you have these very elaborate hairstyles simplified to this genre scene that is accessible to a larger audience. Another thing that is catering to a larger audience and making pieces like this more accessible is the medium that is being used to create it. This is an etching created using dry point which is incising into a metal plate using a stylus so basically a sharp needle and then also aquatint. So aquatint is a fabulous method that is used to create tone on these kinds of etching works. Essentially how aquatint works is that you melt a sort of powder onto the plate and when you actually melt it onto the plate, it, it looks like it's covering the entire surface, but it, it, it's almost like putting a, a layer of glitter on something and there's always going to be some negative space between where the glitter is not hitting. So you then put the plate the plate in acid and the areas that are still exposed and not covered by the rosin are etched in by the acid and then the areas that are covered by the acid are not. So what ends up happening is that you get these microscopic grooves in the metal where the ink can go into and it creates this nice relatively flat area of tone without requiring you to go in and make lines with the stylus. So you can actually wash off the resin and you have have a plate that is able to create tones. So of course if you leave the plate in acid longer then the tone is darker and if you leave it in the acid for not as much time then the tone is going to be lighter because the incision in the plate is not as deep. When we're in the classroom again I'll actually bring in some of my own aquatint and dry point etching plates to show you exactly how this looks. I obviously can't recreate the um, etching process in the classroom because that involves hydrochloric acid and other fun chemicals. So this printmaking method allowed for several copies of the same image to be created and they're a lot more affordable as a result. So Mary Cassatt was actually advised against creating artwork like this because it was seen as devaluing her work and she said Mm, no. She was very much about making artwork more accessible to the masses and really conveying this idea that art is for everybody. It's not supposed to be this super elitist thing that only a couple of people could enjoy. So I've always appreciated Cassatt for that. This particular image was very heavily influenced by an artwork in Cassatt's collection. When we look at these artworks, we're seeing a lot of very obvious similarities. For one, there is the view from the back right here, and we have this three-quarter view where we're seeing a part of the ear and somewhat of a profile of the face, and then we're also seeing parts of the face in a reflection in some way. Um, there's also this notion of inspecting or fixing one's hair. Um, there is the medium, which is similar printmaking. Of course, this is an etching and this is a woodblock print. There's also a use of pattern that is being employed. So Cassatt has created this kind of floral pattern in the floor right here. And in this image, there is a um, an asterisk pattern in the figure's robe. 
Um, there's also these more soft contour lines that are used to indicate the figure and the furniture, whereas the background tends to use these more geometric lines, like in the blinds right here. Um, col pastel color schemes and these very candid, kind of more domestic and private poses. Here is another version of the coiffer that you might see um, referenced when we talk about Mary Cassatt's piece. That's another fantastic thing about print making is that you could experiment with different colors or you can layer on different plates to create these different composite images. So this one right here is utilizing pinks um, and a kind of lighter um, peach flesh tone for the figure. And then this one is utilizing a sort of light blue in the drapery around the figure's waist. This is a study that Mary Cassatt did for the coiffer right here. I believe this piece was done in pencil. I love including this piece because, again, you're getting a sense of this is not something that's intended to be scandalous. Like, she doesn't really care. She's putting in the fat rolls. The breasts are lopsided and uneven. She's just painting things exactly as they are and how they look to her in a non-objectified way, which is always super refreshing, especially when we're talking about Western art. We are now going to be moving on to post-impressionism. A lot of students tend to put impressionism and post-impressionism in the same category. Um, this is not always accurate and oftentimes I understand why this happens because they are oftentimes conflated and in fact a lot of artists will actually create actually created artworks in both the impressionist style and the post-impressionist style. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. So post-impressionists have a lot of the same goals as the impressionists in that they are really focusing on elements of light and color, but the post-impressionists are also concerned with structure and form and having things grounded. Like even things that are not necessarily always grounded, so things like light sources or like radiating light are given a sort of harsh outline. They are given substance in some way. There's also a lot of like quote unquote sculpting that artists are attempting to do with their brushes. When you look at this painting, for example, right here, this is by Cezanne, you'll notice that the artist has utilized these very blocky strokes to indicate highlights or to indicate the contours in this drapery right here. There's not always a super soft transition between the tones and oftentimes there are lines in places where they might not necessarily exist in real life. So that's one of the distinguishing features between impressionism and post-impression post-impressionism is that most of the time post-impressionism has some sort of outline. So in this Van Gogh piece, you can see outlines around these trees. You can see outlines around these figures and around this dog right here. You can see outlines around these oranges. Even this piece, which at first glance looks pretty impressionistic, you can see outlines around the figure's face and then defining especially the facial features. So that's one of the more distinguishing features. I typically won't ask you to distinguish between Impressionism and Post-Impressionism just because they are so similar, but if you are asked to do that on the AP exam or you come across a work um, and you are considering those things, it's best to look for an outline. So there is this sort of paradox to post-impressionism. We have the use of abstraction to identify and emphasize the structure and form of a subject concurrently. So there's an abstraction that is used where you are kind of changing how something is perceived, but at the same time you are enhancing elements of it that are recognizable. It's very difficult to explain, and I apologize, I'm not doing a great job at it. There's also two different main schools of post-impressionism. Um, the Cezanne um, train of thought tends to focus on this more blocky and like linear aspect of painting. This is the more kind of like heavy rendering, whereas the pointillism school of post-impressionism was about creating images using these layered bits of light. So Seurat was perhaps the most famous of the pointillists. He created these images that were very large and 
oftentimes involve the application of paint in these very small colored dots, and he would layer them on top of one another. Um, just like you get with Impressionist paintings, if you zoom in really close to any one portion of a Seurat painting, virtually nothing is recognizable. You have to really step back and get a full picture to understand what is going on. So unfortunately, we don't have any pointillism in the post-impressionism um, curriculum for the College Board. But I just wanted to bring it up because it's cool. So this is our first post-impressionist work, The Starry Night. You've probably seen it before. It's perhaps one of the most famous artworks in the world. This piece is really the epitomization of the impasto technique. So we started talking about the impasto technique last unit in early Europe in the colonial Americas. You'll recall that it is this very thick paste-like application of paint, oftentimes to the point where it is literally lifting off of the canvas and adding a sense of um, like a third dimension to the painting. If you actually look at these paintings from a side view, sometimes you can actually see the paint coming off of the surface. So um, Van Gogh was very well known for his use of impasto as well as his trademark use of these very short, thin brush strokes that he would oftentimes layer on top of one another to create these very mobile compositions. There's always like a swirliness to Van Gogh's work. Um, to give you a sense of what impasto looks like up close, these are some close-up images of the um, various aspects of Starry Night painting. We have a bit of the moon right here. Um, and I love this image because it's shown at an angle and you can see like this, this paint is thick enough that it's casting shadows. And then this view right here, you can see that the artist has used these, these strokes in the circular motion around the stars to show the illumination of this light right here. So this painting was done towards the end of Van Gogh's life. He had a brief and very productive period um, of art creation while he was in an asylum. So you've probably heard the stories of Van Gogh struggling with mental illness and poverty throughout his life. A lot of like kind of disturbing narratives surround this oftentimes like Van Gogh is used to kind of support the the notion of the tortured artist, quote unquote, tortured artist. And a lot of times people will actually refuse to seek treatment for mental illness because they're like, well, Van Gogh like made beautiful art and he could only do it because he had schizophrenia. And actually a lot of the, his best work was created when he was receiving treatment. So don't let anybody um, make that excuse for you. Get mental health help, please. So this particular piece um, was not a scene that necessarily existed in real life. Rather, it's a composite landscape. So it's very likely that these hills in the background here were viewable from the asylum that was in the French countryside where Van Gogh spent the last year or two of his life. Um, he also spent a lot of time um, looking at these more kind of like rural provincial scenes like these small towns. Um, there are some art historians that say this is very Dutch right here, this pointed steeple. So this might have actually come from Northern Europe rather than France. Um, he was born and raised in Northern Europe. Um, one of the things that Van Gogh also paid attention to at this point in his life was the treatment of light. So Van Gogh spent a lot of time in Paris and other urban areas, but then when he um, ended up being at this, um, this very rural place where he was um, in hospital, um, he noticed that the way that light changed, um, that he could see the Milky Way, that he could see the, um, the individual colors of the stars in the night sky. And he was really fascinated with how light hit objects and how, like, how he could potentially paint nighttime scenes and like, get over the difficulty of doing that. So oftentimes, because of the difficulty of night painting and the fact that it's really hard to receive a consistent light source and be able to paint these scenes at night, he ended up having to do a lot of these compositely. So he would do studies um, and then bring them back to his studio and paint there. There's also evidence that this piece um, was likely made using um, other paintings that he had previously done, um, and he incorporated elements of those paintings into this one. So. 
um, you'll notice that the light is very tangible in this piece. This is very much an epitomization of post-impressionism, where you have this thing that is not necessarily tangible made into something with substance. Light typically doesn't look like this, yet Van Gogh is adding in these elements to give light substance and to give it texture. Um, so this is very post-impressionist of him. Another thing that Van Gogh is doing is that he's creating some drama. He has these two sharp verticals in his painting. He has this very dramatic, almost flame-like cypress bush in the foreground. He's particularly famous for these dramatic, um, tall trees. And then he's also emulating the same strong upward motion with the steeple of this church right here. And of course, we have these horizontal elements, too, of the Milky Way swirling um, to the left and right of the piece, as well as the brush strokes that are carrying us from left to right here. So again, impasto. That's a great word to remember for this painting. Okay, this next piece is by Paul Gauguin. And Gauguin was one of those artists that typically gets the tortured artist label. He tends to have a lot of suicidal ideation in his artwork, and this particular work in particular also involves the sort of suicidal ideation. So this is just a warning for those of you who are sensitive to those subjects. So this piece is titled, get ready for it, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? And Where Are We Going? It's a very existential title for a very existential painting. So Gauguin actually started off um, as a, what is typically referred to as a Sunday painter. He did it as a hobby, and I believe he was a stockbroker for a time when he was living in France. So he eventually left his wife and kids in France and just went to Tahiti because that's what he wanted to do and he wanted to pursue his art. Um, of course, he didn't have a great time there. Um, he, he spent various, um, he did various voyages to and from Tahiti. And at this point in time, he was very likely dying of syphilis, which um, for those of you who have done research on sexually transmitted infections, does some weird things to your brain. Um, he also had an open fracture in his ankle. So an open fracture is when the bone sticks out. It's not fun. Um, he also um, was facing destitution. He was very poor at this point in time. And he was basically resigned to this idea of, I'm gonna paint this and then I'm gonna go into the forest and commit suicide. So when he heard of his daughter's death, this basically catalyzed, hit this rather fervent creation of this painting. He reportedly painted it in under a month, which is pretty remarkable considering how large it is. To give you a sense of the scale, these figures are about life size. So this is a continuous narrative, as best as we can tell. On the right, we have where do we come from? We have this infant right here. Um, the what are we is in the middle right here. We have this figure that is reaching up and grasping some fruit from this tree. And then we have where are we going, which is this older figure over here who is kind of covering their face and staring at the viewer. So Gauguin really intended this piece to be like his last great hurrah, his last will. He actually wrote about it extensively when he was talking with one of his friends and correspondences. He actually had a representative that remained in France to continue selling his work when he could. And he wrote about this painting a lot. Um, this painting is also heavily associated with the symbolism movement, which we will cover next class. To give you a really short overview of symbolism. Essentially, symbolism involves a lot of imagery that is very personal to the artist and is not necessarily always able to be interpreted by people other than the artist. It's very personal and oftentimes requires a specific correspondence or documentation from the artist in order to understand it completely. So when we cover symbolist artwork next class, I'll also bring up this painting again. So Gauguin, as you probably noticed, is not necessarily painting in a Western convention. Again, 
first of all, not in the sense that he is painting using these um, like blended colors or creating these figures that are intended to be like very objectifying. Um, he's also using colors um, that are not conventional in painting, particularly for figures. He's using this very bright, vibrant yellow, for example, in this side. And then he's also using blue to shade the skin, which is highly unusual. So Gauguin was very heavily influenced by non-Western art. Of course, he spent a lot of time in Tahiti and was influenced by the artwork that was created there. Um, he was also influenced by Japanese artwork um, as well as Egyptian artwork. And he kind of fancied himself as this, um, this kind of like vanguard of Western culture going into non-Western, like, civilizations and kind of gathering those influences and then putting them together and meshing them into his own individual style. So Gauguin was like pretty gross. He married like three teenage Tahitian girls when he was in Tahiti and he oftentimes unfortunately took advantage of a lot of the um, the people who lived here. He reportedly gave the entire island of Tahiti syphilis. He was not a super outstanding or great guy. So just keep that in mind. So this is an expanded version of the painting to give you a better sense of what it looks like. Oftentimes when I have these smaller images, it's harder to see what's going on. And there's also some correspondence from his representative back in France um, that is taken verbatim, at least translated from French to, to English, that gives you a sense of what each of these individual elements means, and I find them very helpful. So um, we again have the um, indicate the main narrative, which is where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going that are being indicated here. As a brief synopsis, Gauguin says it is a canvas 4 meters 50 in width by 1 meter 70 in height, so 4.5 by 1.7 I'm assuming. The two upper corners are chrome yellow with an inscription on the left and my name on the right like a fresco whose corners are spoiled with age and which is appliqued upon a golden wall. So he is envisioning this painting as something that has been plastered upon a wall and that something is intended to have like this more ancient quality. You'll notice that these corners right here have a gold background. So Gauguin put his name right here and then the name of the painting here, it's in French. So you might recall these gold backgrounds from Byzantine artwork. It creates like the sense of vastness and timelessness. So he's very much again fancying himself as this like timeless ancient painter who has knowledge of many different art forms and, and art periods. Um, and that this thing has been plastered upon a wall for everybody to see. Um, there is this one section over here which describes two figures dressed in purple confiding their thoughts to one another. An enormous crouching figure raises its arm and, and stares in astonishment upon these two who dare to think of their destiny. So again, the, the language that he's using, he, he obviously has a vision in his brain of what the scene means and what these individual components mean, but it's not necessarily always clear to us, the audience, exactly what these different things mean. We have an idol, its arms mysteriously raised in a sort of rhythm, seems to indicate the beyond. Again, this would not make sense to anybody except for Gauguin. And then lastly, an old woman nearing death appears to accept everything to resign herself to her thoughts. She completes the story. At her feet, a strange white bird holding a lizard in its claws represents the futility of words. Again, Gauguin, what are you doing? So this is our last piece in the Post-Impressionism unit, Monse Victory by Cézanne. So this is one of 11 paintings that Cézanne painted of this view. He actually owned a, an acre of land nearby and painted there frequently. A lot of his contemporaries report, oh yeah, he took me to that same spot and he just painted and didn't say anything. That's so Cézanne. And, these, and it, he was quite obsessed with Monse Victory. Um, he not only painted 11 uh, kind of like landscape paintings of this piece, but when you look at his other work, you see the same mountain appearing in different views and lots of different, especially figurative artworks. He was just obsessed with it and painted it over and over and over again. So chances are if you see this same kind of weird mountain in a painting and it's painted in this very evocative way, then chances are it's a saison. So... You'll notice that this piece use, 
uses an unconventional perspective technique. We have these warmer colors in the foreground and these cooler colors in the background. At least that's what the art history textbook says. I still have trouble when it comes to distinguishing warm colors from cool colors because you can have a warm blue and a cold blue or a warm yellow or a cold yellow. It just depends. Um, so when you look at this piece, you'll also notice that it has like three quote unquote registers in the composition. We have the mountain and the sky and one bit of the painting and then we have this middle ground right here which is mostly yellows and lighter greens and then the foreground right here which is I believe a layer of treetops and this is mostly dark right here. So when you squint you can kind of see the three different tiers of the painting. So you'll also notice too that the artist has used these very geometric evocative brushstrokes to define this area. He is not really concerned with blending the paint into the surface, as you can see, especially in the sky. He's kind of just like slapping the colors on top of one another. Um, for a lot of the straight edges, I imagine that he would have used a palette knife. So just um, that a palette knife is this diamond shaped um, piece of metal that's attached to a stick and is oftentimes used by artists to create these more defined lines on paintings. It's also used to scrape up paint on a palette and get it into a pile instead of having it just flat and drying everywhere. Another thing that um, Cezanne is doing is that he's not restricting green to the forest. He's not restricting purple to the mountains in the sky. This is another technique that we see in Impressionism a lot where you're having the colors scattered throughout the piece. So you can see um, that the artist has strategically included bits of purple in the midground and foreground. You can see on the facades of these houses right here and then even a little bit in the underpainting of the foreground right here. Likewise, there's just bits of green in the sky because that's what Cezanne does. He's creating a cohesive um, narrative to this piece where there's a little bit of green everywhere. There's a little bit of purple everywhere, because why not? And that is what is unifying this painting, kind of more compositionally speaking. 